we go, we move on to our next session. <coughs> I would like to call upon Uncle Mahesh to introduce the session. <coughs> Loving salutations to the omnipresent Lord residing in our hearts. Sairam to you all. What is the purpose of life for each one of us? Anybody answer? Realizing yourself. Sorry? Realizing. Realizing. Yes, it's, it's a bit higher answer. <coughs> True. But why do you want to realize? Oh yeah. Where we come from. Why, why do you want to do that? We don't know where we came from. What we are. But why should you know? It's a question mark. So, what do you get out of it? <laughs> so, what do you want? I know you say it's high, but then at this point in time, that's what we are told that our purpose is this and that. So, <laughs> you know that I even know. So, now I, I know that that's what it is, and I really want to. Know. True, true. I'm, I'm not denying it. I'm trying to get a simpler answer. That's all. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry? Just want to be happy. Exactly. You want to be happy. Okay? What is being happy? Living in peace. Living in peace. Okay. That for some people, living in peace is happiness. <coughs> Somebody else, what is happiness? No worries, man. No worries. <laughs> okay. That is, no worries is happiness. Okay. That's fine. Seeing others happy. Seeing others is happy. Okay. No fear. Please. No fear. Not being <coughs> scared of anything is happiness. Yes, true. Because there is no right or wrong answer for that. Anybody? Being perfect. Being perfect is happiness. No, content. Content. Being content is happiness. True? To the purpose of life to benefit others. To help others, to be a benefit to others is happiness. So what? We got so many answers and each one of them is right. Right from self-realization to just being happy is happiness. Right? So what does it indicate? What do we learn out of this so many answers? Search, that's right. In a simple terms, it is internal. See, happiness is something which is not outside. Happiness is a feeling. Suppose, for example, you ask a little boy what is happiness. For that moment, he says, I have seen a new toy. <coughs> Having that toy is happiness for me. Right? So, is the happiness in the toy? No, because for him only that moment he will be happy if you have the toy. After 15 minutes of playing with it, that new cricket bat is happiness. Right? So possessing something is not happiness. <coughs> Getting an internal joy, feeling that you are being happy is happiness. How does it happen? There is somebody who is inside us makes us to get that feeling of happiness. That is Rudra. That is one of the meanings. Only one of the I don't know whether Ram should correct. That is one of the meanings of Rudra. The one who makes you happy. The one who makes you realize what is happiness is Rudra. There are so many meanings to Rudra. Typically Rudra, you get a thought that Rudra means destruction. The, no? But actually there are different meanings. Many, many meanings of Rudra. One of them is one who makes you happy. So how do we feel happy in daily life? We got so many answers of achieving happiness. How do we feel happy? Not having fear, a beautiful reply. See, fear, happiness, contentment, self-realization, all these are different emotions. Emotions come out of your mind. What is mind? A bunch of thoughts which never stops. Somebody was giving an example. Uh, thought is like a bacteria. Okay? It, it multiplies itself to 8 million in 5 minutes. <laughs> so it's like you get a thought, next thought, next thought, next thought. You start here, you land somewhere else. No, you don't have limit, you don't have control. Okay? So that's what decides your ability to be happy. If you think positive, if you stay happy, if you are able to control your emotions, you are happy because you are 
saving your relationship, whether it's with your wife, with family or friends. The moment you are not able to control your emotions, you are in trouble. You are not going to be happy even if you want to. Okay? So, an attempt is being made in the next session of the workshop is that we are trying to look at the actual meaning of each anuvaka, what it, what it means, what it means, and what could be an internal meaning of it, which we attempted to do, put an internal meaning you know, to that, what exactly it means. And how we are going to apply to be happy in life. So, it is not necessary that each one of us need to be an expert in Rudram, or at least should know uh, the complete meaning of Rudram because it is provided. All that is the zeal what we need to apply whatever we are trying to learn in daily life so that we can stay happy. Okay? So the actual process Prashant is going to explain now. Uh, we are going to split into multiple groups, 11 groups because there are 11 workers. So we are going to uh, uh, split into groups. Some time is given and we are going to understand the meaning and internal meaning and discuss the questions. After that, each group is going to present. And it's, it's almost like a study circle. You know? We will try to interact. The purpose is trying to apply the beautiful Rudra into our daily life. We have seen so many beautiful experiences from people trying to get just mere chanting. But what if you know little meaning? The tip of the iceberg and apply it in life. How much of more joy you are going to get? What will Prashant? So what we are going to do is form 11 groups, all right? And uh, I would just like to call upon a few people. Cultivates and the one who harvests, Nama to the one who 
the shloka and at the cessation of the sound vibration, Nama to the forest joints and to the famous mysterious spirits, Nama to the famous and anonymous. Nama to these are the natural meaning of the world. No? How when we Rajesh Kaya to meet the first one. Exactly. So that's what makes it different. We have we have the facility, we have the, 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 the if you like the process. Mm -hmm. We have the channel. Oh wow. You have the post. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, she's our team leader, by the way. Oh, is that right? <laughs> so, so please take a nice one. Take it. Uh, thank you. Let's see what you're discussing here. Oh, wow. So that's the natural resources that we are discussing. Yes, okay, yeah. number two. How can we apply Swami's teaching of sealing on desires to protect environment? Yeah. Happy with one house, one house. Don't go by three houses. Oh, that is good really stuff. <laughs> I mean, yeah, it's not about... Uh, you know, I'm just, I'm just being cheeky. Yeah, yeah. There are tendencies in the like propensity. Like, we are seeing the anxieties and the tendencies in the society. Have any problem normally we tend to say not mine. We can be shunned in responsibility. Yes. We always want to put the blame on others. That is, the problem is not mine? Or? Yeah. So that's why the questions have been directed. Or so, like for example, like the uh, put here. This is what I know. Basically, saying you just need infinity and diversity. Yeah. Yeah. Everything is divided. Yeah. The early parts of the music. Yeah. Yeah. Like, you know, the one you know, who says the way the Kofra color has got is the river. Yes. That is everything that basically. That's what it does. I know this part here refers to what we should aspire for. Yeah. So it can be, as my uh, uncle was saying, it can be, you know, we only know a fraction of it. Now, uh, with the groups in the what are the ones in the city? What are the ones in the city? And just trying to see what's going on. And that's the one that you have to do. Yes, yes. Yes, and to probably to hold on to the good thoughts and then spread it. Yeah. I think it is.
so what we did in this session was each group had one underworker. So all of you, each group had different questions. You know why? Because the material was prepared by different people. <laughs> so, no question was the same in any group. And if you had two questions, it's just the way it is. If you had two pages of questions, it was just the way it is. So this is how it is. Now, um, I would like to call upon group one to, uh, perhaps before you present, just also highlight what were the questions uh, and key points. Of, uh, so where's group one? Is there a group one representative? Yeah, come here. of first Anubhaka focuses on fear of Shiva's wrath due to the sinning. Swami says we should have love for God, fear of sin, morality in society. How do we convert this fear of God to love for God? If everyone can hear the question, how do we convert fear for God or love for God? So that's the question. Uh, first, love yourself. Uh, learn about the beautiful qualities of God and from self to selfless. of anger how do you take advantage of this awareness turn it into compassion think of the other person with awareness comes change our third question was what are the practical ways to manage and transform our negative tendencies to positive tendencies. In certain situations, we just need to take some time, step back, identify our negative tendencies, and in the process of taking time, we could talk to the universe and wait for them, to, uh, wait for the universe to present the answers to us. So, to us. Our fourth question was, can we separate ourselves from our emotions? Please analyze the advantages and disadvantages. The advantages are think clearly, separates your mind from your heart. We had lots of disadvantages. It's very hard to separate your emotions and sometimes by separating yourselves from your emotions you can lose, like you can form a lack of empathy for others and you're unable to understand what they're going through. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. 
very, <coughs> that was very good observations. Um, I just wanted to clarify on the last presentation, the clarification what you have given. Emotions, what we meant was negative as well as positive. If you separate yourself from positive emotions, that's right, you become like a stone. You are not able to empathize or sympathize. But you need to separate yourself from your negative emotions so that your positive emotions would come up. If you want to fill a vessel, you need to empty it first. So if you are filled with negative emotions, unless you empty, you will not be able to fill with the positive emotions. So the ability to discriminate between negative and positive, and getting rid of negative, improving positive, was the aim of that question actually. I am sorry if it is not communicated properly to you. In most, when we discussed about these questions, I am just trying to summarize is that the first Anuvaka starts with bowing down to Lord Shiva and requesting him to get rid of his anger and show his compassion onto us. So the important aspect here is anger. Anger is a very strong emotion. When it is controlled, it becomes a positive emotion. When it, when it controls us, it becomes a negative emotion. So the, the important question there was that, how are you able to manage your anger? What are the facts that help to manage your anger, to understand your anger? When you understand your anger, you can make it positive. When you don't understand your anger or anybody's anger, that becomes negative. There's, there's nothing wrong with the anger as it is, but what is important is managing that anger. So any thoughts on, see, one of the things was that, one of the simple solution was that if you are able to understand the intention of the anger, either your intention or if you are facing the anger, other person's anger, I think fairly you will be able to manage the situation. So any thoughts on that? How do you identify the intention? Then later you see why. Go back and analyze why did you get angry. Have compassion, you know, rather than blaming other people or making you angry. You have compassion on other people. And that will make you feel like, you know, why, the reason. See, the key word is observe. <laughs> when do you observe something? When can you observe something? Silence. Silence, yes. Yes. Meditation. Yeah. Uh, when you can step back a little bit from yeah. the situation. Exactly. The question is what is, when can you observe something when you are different from it? You can't observe yourself unless you have a memory, right? <coughs> uh, unless you have a mirror. But, if you are trying to observe your intention, which means that you are separating yourself from the emotion, then you are pure. Then you are able to do it. You can look at it very silently. That, gets, that leads you to the, uh, the state of meditation because you are trying to become calm. I will not take much time but very quickly I just want to share one specific theory which was taught to us in MBA uh, of managing the anger or managing the uh, situation. Uh, it's called transaction analysis. Have you heard it about it any time? See, every human psych is always remains in three levels. Adult, child and parent. Okay? Each time you can observe yourself, you are in either of these three states. Always. You keep moving from child to parent to adult to... It depends on what kind of mentality or what kind of emotion you are in, situation you are in. So when there is a conflict because of anger or the situation of anger, you need to know that the other person who is showing anger or whether you are uh, showing the anger, which state of mind you are in. Especially when others are angry at you, how do you manage, how do you avoid conflict. If the person is showing us anger, being a parent, sometimes if you are in a customer service situation, they think that they know everything and you don't know anything. Right? They come say, that, what, what the hell are you doing, it is that, that, that's the role and all that. So identify that guy is in a parent state, he feels that he knows everything, you go to child mode. Yes, what you are saying is right. I am sorry, I didn't know about it at all. Oh, that. Then he comes from parent situation to adult situation. 
you go to adult situation, problem is solved. Because at adult situation, both are mature. You talk facts, you manage the facts. <clears throat> Sometimes people in childish mode, they are adamant, they want only that. They don't understand anything. You have to go to parent situation and explain to them why it is wrong. Because they are in a child mode, they will very easily understand. And they come to adult stage, you go to adult stage, problem is solved. If he is an adult, you, are, you have to be an adult. And if somebody is showing their anger, displeasure when they are in adult mode, it should be genuine. So you will have to address the problem and solve it. All this can happen only when you are able to separate yourself from the emotion. That's what will solve the problem. That's what exactly first Anvaka of Rudram explains. Anger management. We'll go to the second Anvaka. Which is the second group? question was, um, or at least what we had to do was consider why these tendencies show up. So first off, we've learned so many like teachings from Swami and one of those things are values. We always fail to put them into practice, practice and that's why they tend to show up more often. Uh, the second reason, well, most of us are really lazy and we don't do much. Another is you have to understand the meanings of the values that we're taught. And we take a lot of things for granted as well. Um, the third step, ah, the third question was what steps should we take to get rid of these tendencies? And the uh, um, obvious one is to put what Swami taught us into practice. And to do that, we need to first understand what Swami is teaching us and the meanings behind it. And, um, and then we use those values to our advantage. And looking back at uh, people who spoke before about the experiences with Rudram, how Rudram helped them. Uh, so we said chanting Rudram will help us get rid of those tendencies and develop, developing the understanding for Rudram, which is the most important thing. So yeah. That's <laughs> Oh, yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, first up, uh, never say you can't do it, make sure you can do it. Yes. Take out the T, take out the T, and then you take out the T, and Uh, I think the guys have done a tremendous job actually in putting together their thoughts uh, in that one. Uh, right from second Anuvaka to eighth um, uh, in Rudram, we always have, it talks about the tendency what we have to get rid of. We are going to see that repeating in most of the Anuvakas from three to, from two to eight. And um, the questions are based purely to, uh, though related to Rudram, also to be a bit of general in nature so that you know it's easy for everybody to uh, contribute and follow and then try to relate it to Rudra. So the bad tendencies were correctly, uh, correctly identified and um, it's mainly the Kama the Loba, you know, that's the tendency which is um, um, the main thing which we have to watch full for. And the steps to get rid of these tendencies is um, as uh, rightly pointed out about Swami's uh, own teaching, we also have this nine-point code of conduct. If, if that is being followed, um, that's going to take us one step uh, closer to following this very easily. 
The other thing that is mainly prescribed is the self-audit or self-analysis. Right? If we identify the bad tendency within us, and then at the end of each day we see what, what have we done, and has it been minimized or reduced, and what steps can we take to reduce, take one bad quality and try to get rid of that. And that's something that's prescribed again by Swami. That's the second Anavaka. Can we call the fifth one now? <laughs> Third one, please. Three questions for the third Anavaka. Um, the common theme of getting rid of the bad qualities. The first question was, Rudra is seen as manifest in various criminal personalities that hurt. In spite of so many crimes indulged by us, he patiently bears everything. Describe a negative tendency that you have experienced and how did you overcome it? I think... The first one was being judgmental. Uh, what we must try to do is give it a chance and change the perspective. And stereotyping and give it a chance, accept yourself and try not to reflect. Okay? And the intentions, not to worry, ignore and don't take anything personally. And reacting, realizing that there could be a reason uh, give it a time, a risk people. So basically, those, those few qualities is um, how we react in any situation, how we don't think and then react. And we had being judgmental to the others. And so on and so forth. The second question. The Lord, is seen as a, the Lord is seen as a focused archer who never lets the target out of sight. We often have spiritual goals that we want to achieve in life. Describe the challenges that you face in achieving these spiritual qualities and goals. Sorry, these spiritual goals, and how did you overcome these challenges? We had um, our company that that can be a barrier for us many a times, and to understand and accept that it's okay to be different and confident about it, and just being aware of our influences as well. And focusing on our daily schedules, trying not to be, trying to be organized and know your priority. And uh, knowing your priorities and know your goal. And the last one is labeling it can be part of our lives. Uh, should be a habit, include in your life. <laughs> in the third paragraph and third question, it states that all these are all states of the body. All are stated as these belong to the body and not mine. Give, give a practical example of how you practice this affirmation in your daily life. You need to understand that you are not the doer. You're just the instrument. When something goes wrong, reflect that uh, there is a purpose for everything. Even things that appear go uh, appear to go wrong. Thank you. Thank you. I was trying to get a little bit more of uh, personal experiences, but of, of course, you know, everyone wants to be very um, uh, politically correct here yeah, and things like that. So it takes a lot of guts, I know. Some of the questions that we have put forth uh, really dwell down in a lot of uh, personal questions. And it's up to us, actually. When I think one way of looking at it is, is this. You know, when you talk about, you know, criminal personalities and things like that, yeah, Uncle talked about the pen that, you know, was used to stabbing. It can be as major as that. Or it can be as minor as, for example, I'll give you my example. I'll be going at 108, 109 on the highway, and the moment I see a cop, I go down at 100. <laughs> so, it can be as subtle as that. Or, um, 
you happen, you know, I happen to, you know, take some food from the cafeteria and I don't like it and I just waste it or do I actually say, never mind, I'll, I don't want to waste food and I want to eat it. So these are, you know, very, very subtle tendencies and it just depends. It's happening every, every, every moment. How do we want to look at it? But the beauty, beautiful thing about this is the Lord is Sahamanaya. You know, it starts with Nam. Nama Sahamanaya Nivyadina. He's, he, he's, just, he's just watching. He's the witness of all our good and also our negative ten tendencies. But he watches and he watches very patiently. You tell him, uh, you know, when many of us have been to party, you know, you go, go at Darshan and say, Swami, Swami, I, I give you the card. It's a very happy. Swami, I did this very, very happy. But he's waiting to see when you are actually asking what he has come to give. And, and, and then that point, this is the Lord here. The second question talks about this. He's seen as the focused archer who never, ever lets go of the target. And so what he's trying to say is, can we actually, we can actually manifest this. You know, we have targets in our daily lives, at work, at home, you've got your household chores. How many of us actually say, when we wake up and we say, I, I'm supposed to do this, this, this and this. Then after, at the end of the day, ah, it's okay, you still got tomorrow. Mm -hmm. You know? And then when it comes to that tomorrow, you say, ah, oh, brother, no time. <laughs> no time. But that no time actually is because we have actually... So these are very, very simple, simple examples, but you can take it to different levels. And that last part is the third paragraph where it says, these states are not the body. So many times when we say, oh, brother, can you help me? Oh, you know, I finished work, you know, at seven, I'm very tired. I haven't had my dinner. Yeah. We can come with different, different experiences. Like, um, you know, I haven't slept this, this, this. But when it really matters to you, suddenly we've got, we got that energy. How is it? Because our priorities have shifted. So imagine if each one of us here can put aside our, you know, our bodily... I know, but it takes, you know, sometimes, yeah, sometimes we can do away with less than that half an hour less of, half an hour less of sleep, for example. We can do with... Um, you know, just trying to, the word here is sacrifice, but it may seem like a sacrifice, but actually at the end of the day, we are the beneficiary of that. So it's just thought provoking questions. So at the end of the day, it says, um, this is not the body, you know, uh, we are not, it's trying to get rid of that body consciousness. So we we'll call upon, um, so thank you group three, uh, we hope group four, <laughs> this is group four, I know what for. So we have the fourth Anivaka. In the fourth Anivaka, Rudra described as the creator and worker of all kinds. He is the cause of both significant and the minor. He is seen as the one who pierces with disease from time to time, teaches experimentally and to enable settling the karmic account in an accelerated manner. He is seen as the opposite of himself, where the thinnest atom is compared to the entire universe. So the main thing we are going to talk, I think we have two questions. Um, how does judgmental attitude affect in your spiritual swadhana? And the other one is, how do you differentiate between being judgmental and discriminative? So, Sister is going to put some of the word. Becoming self-aware, reflective, analytical, mm -hmm. yeah, and observant, and observing. Um, so, in conclusion, we thought that <coughs> when you chant the rhythm, you surrender. If you focus on just the rhythm, you'd be listening to the words and the sounds, you're tuning out the external world or any of the negative forms. <coughs> Thank you. Very well done. Um, now a quick summary. What is
has been judgmental. Someone else said something. Having, a, having an opinion. See, the very common mentality of human being, human nature, is forming an opinion. Right? That's why they call it first impression is the best impression. Whatever opinion you form on a person, it gets into your subconscious mind. It is not conscious, it gets into subconscious mind. So whenever you see a person, or whenever you are you need to take a decision, whenever you need to take uh, make an interaction with that person, what comes up is whatever you have recorded in your subconscious mind comes up first. Come what may, whatever good work that person is doing, if you think that your first opinion was that that guy is selfish, he is egoistic, so whatever he is doing, you think that no, no, he is doing with some selfish motive. No, no, he is, he, no, he just wants to get name and fame. So anything he does, it gets attached to that. If you form a good opinion, so whatever that person, if he's doing something wrong, he said, no, that's right, because he's doing. Example, Prashant gave, you're traveling at 110. If you have a good opinion, no, no, he's trying to save somebody, so it's okay. If you have a negative opinion, that fellow is always like that, lazy, he starts late and goes fast. <laughs> right? So it, it's judgmental is having a preconceived notion and sticking to it, you know, stereotyping, all that, you, what you said is right. The second was, how do you, be discriminative but not judgmental. <clears throat> Discriminative nation is something which is the gift that God has given to us. Trying to know what is good, what is bad. And we depend on intellect to decide on that value system. The solution for these two, for me, the simplest one is living in present. Living in now moment. If you always live in present, you are not influenced by your preconceived notions. Okay? And if then it also, living in present also helps you to apply the discrimination to the maximum extent possible. Because you are going to decide at that moment whether it is right or wrong. That's what is discrimination. It is not always universal. A thing what you are doing now may be wrong, but the same thing when you do it at a different moment could be right. So if you live in present, not getting influenced or not getting worried about your past, or not getting anxious about your future, then you can avoid these two. The, the group has done really well on that, and they have. Aisha, Aisha. <coughs> can, can you feel open for discussion? Yes, yes, please. If something <coughs> is really important, we can do that. Brother, I often struggle. Thanks, Mark, for clearly giving the definition for judgment. It's, it's, it's one perspective. I always have problem with this, you know, and people tend to kind of broaden it, say to me, oh, it shouldn't be judgmental. If people choose to be non-judgmental, the world will suffer more. I'll give you an example. I may be wrong here. Bro. Gandhi, he took to the highest philosophy of life. But he was judgmental. But he's not judgmental of the people who are doing the actions. He was judgmental of the actions. And that is why he was never judgmental of the British, you know. But the actions, he condemned it. And he stood up against that. You know. So, Sometimes we, we get carried away, oh, if the person is doing wrong, we shouldn't be judgmental. I, I think we are blowing it out of proportion. This is where I think the, the, the thanks for elaborating on the discrimination. You see, you, you only condemn the action and not the person. It's very important. That is because if you truly believe in the divinity in everybody, there is. He's, at, he's operating at a lower level. So we need to condemn the action now. If, if that means there's no, there's no need for judiciary in the world, am I right or not? We, we need to be critical of the action. There is no difference between discrimination and judgmental. There's no difference. The only difference is when you apply facts and when you are not becoming subjective and not depending on your preconceived notions, it is discrimination. Discrimination with preconceived notion for selfish motives is judgment. As you rightly said, actions, condemning actions is discrimination, condemning a person is judgment. Sorry, brother. Yeah, I was going to uh, agree with Brother Guna and say that um, it's very important that when people suspend their judgment, that they don't become passive. They still must act and still make decisions 
they must still, in a sense, have opinions, but obviously they must be driven by appropriate information, facts, and so forth. But too often, people think that um, the opposite of being judgmental is to, to mean exercising no judgment whatsoever. Mm -hmm. um, having no opinion about anything, <coughs> uh, being the kind of person who never gets involved in anything, never expresses a view about anything, in order to fit in with everybody. And that is not what the opposite of being judgmental is all about. It's not about that. Very well said. See, this brings up one very important point is that following value system, following values, being positive is never an escape route. Often, if something should not be done, we use it as an escape route. We use that excuse not to do something. That is not expected. You are not expected to be inactive. You are expected to be active. The Guru brought out a beautiful point, surrender. What does surrender mean? Does surrender mean inaction? I am surrendered to God, I won't do anything? No. Surrender is, I will do everything to the best of my ability, but leave the result to him. I am not bogged down by the outcome. I do something, I fail miserably. If I have surrendered to that, tomorrow I will go to do the same thing. The outcome is not going to put me off. That is surrender. That is acceptance. When will you accept? When you live in the present moment. Because when you are repeating the same action the next day, you are living in that moment, the outcome of the previous day is not affecting you. You are putting all your 100% effect. Okay? A surgeon performs a surgery, fails, does it mean that he will not do a surgery again? No. He will do it again and again and again. Because outcome is not in his hands. Doing it to the best of his ability is in his hands. So discrimination, what judgmental what we mean is that getting affected by the outcome. Discrimination is not getting affected by the outcome. You deal with a person, you had a bad experience, it doesn't mean that you are not going to deal with him again. You will have to deal with him again, but be careful of what went wrong that is being discriminative. If you are not being careful and you just follow the previous outcome, then you are being judgmental. That is the subtle difference between the two. We call the fifth group. In the <laughs> <laughs> okay, we are doing the fifth <coughs> Anuvaka. I read the inner meaning. The Ved. <laughs> the various tendencies and propensities we must cast out saying, not mine, Nama, including tendency to be born and cry, to cry and die, to be reborn and cry, to look here and there. Wherever outside instead of inside, to differ in thought, word, and deed, to identify with the limited body, to disrespect who are senior in age and experience, to act rashly without forethought, to unnecessarily procrastinate, to exaggerate and make a hue and cry, and to isolate oneself by selfishly shunning society. The questions are, what is your understanding of creation and the creator? <laughs> Huge. I don't understand the creation or the creator. Um, I think we discussed a lot, I mean, beautiful uh, reviews from the others. It really has, uh, you know, when you said, they all lead into the same thing. So, just going by the question, creation and creator. For me, everything is creation. Everything is, you know, it's like entire universe is creation. So, from a blade of grass to an ant to a huge thing, it is all creation for me. From the nature, if you go to the nature, the baby in the womb, everything is creation. The creator, obviously, the superpower behind that is the creator. That's how I understand. But and also you find that um, um, as, as the, the Lord has said that, um, that he has divided himself so that he will love himself. 
he has separated himself so that he will love himself. And to understand the creation, um, so that's how it is. Uh, the creator has divided himself so that he will be able to love himself and the whole thing is in play as well. And so we have uh, put in some points. Do you like to read some points? Yes. Yeah, realize to, to understand its potential and to everything is perfect, available in ab abundance. And I just go by Prashant's uh, point earlier of um, giving our personal experiences. It is very important that all these have got some personal experience because we can read the you know bookish way of doing it. But for me, unless I experience it personally, all this means nothing to me. So I go back to the personal experience of even my own growth from where I was to where I am today is an aspect of creation. Because he willed it, it is that's how he wanted it. Of course, as uh, previous speakers said that you know we have to make an effort. So when we make an effort, what happens is a creation for me. So that's how I see it. And the second question was, why learning about creation is important. So <coughs> we said that um, to understand God we have to learn about his creation and so we will understand the creator better so we have to learn about everything the, the whole world is a creation we are his creation and, um, and everything is there. the third question was are we fully dependent on God's will for learning about creation for that matter anything we do in life. Now when I read that, first answer that came to me in my mind is yes. But then we discussed over it and brought that discrimination aspect into it. While everything is God's will, He has given us the discrimination power to choose between right and the wrong. And I do have a question here for the, for the people because I asked in our group as well. Would you condemn the act of terrorism as God's will? Would, yeah, would you consider act of terrorism as God's will? Yeah, so the, that's when the topic came about as discrimination. Now even in that thought, had, does God play a part? Is a question. So we ended up with an open question. So. It, while it is God's will, I'd like to get a bit more deeper into that. So I'll leave it with that. I think uh, we have nailed it on the um, first question and second question. The, um, the, the main reason for uh, invoking the creation into the whole thing is um, we have listened to Swami on um, several discourses. He said, um, if you want to get self-realized, okay, there is no way that you can do it without meditating on the Creator or the creation for that matter. And it is for that purpose to, un to develop a knowledge on what the creation is, how it took place, who the Creator is, all becomes very important. And uh, as uncle said, uh, Swami's quote of, I separated myself from myself so that I can love myself, okay? So that, uh, in a nutshell, is a creation in itself. Like, there was Brahma in those days, and then Brahma, when he separated himself, not him, his body separated, we are all part of his limbs. So that's, that's the main crux of the creation, basically. And um, uh, you, you asked a question about, depending on uh, his, um, uh, and wrong things like, you know, or whether it's a will of God, so there's a little bit of uh, understanding needed here. In Vedanta, what they say is, there is a common cause and a specific cause in, in whatever we do. What they say about for common causes, if you take the example of an uh, irrigation aspect, okay, water is a common cause, land is a common cause, okay, the seed is a common cause, the person who does the work is a common cause. But if you take a land and uh, 
put uh, in 50 acres some coconut plant or something like that. Not all the trees yield the same number of coconuts. Why is it that? Because it's the same land, with the same amount of water put into that land, and same amount of effort is put into the whole thing. But the yield is different. Okay, The yield of a particular product depends upon the intrinsic nature of the seed at the end of the day. Okay, So the seed is going to decide how and how many number of coconuts that's going to come out of the whole thing. So that they call it as a specific cause. Okay, God is, acts as a common cause. He is not a specific cause for anything. They give another example like they say, you take your palm, okay, and if you have a small insect in your palm, and if it has to move from one end of your palm to the tip of the top finger, and if I ask you, is that insect dependent on the palm for its movement? You will say yes. Okay? Without the palm it cannot move. But for it to move from here to here, it is independent for its movement. Okay? What to say is God gives you the palm. He is the palm without which not a blade of grass moves. But he doesn't move you. What you move is you, not God. But without God, you cannot move. So, if there is a terrorist activity, you cannot blame God. Same way, if there is a charitable activity, you cannot praise God. God just gives the foundation on which we make the movement. Okay. I think that will answer to some extent you. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Sorry. No, I think it's good. <clears throat> good to open for discussion. <clears throat> Are you stopping me from talking? <laughs> Are you sending some vibration, brother? <laughs> brother, in the Bhagavad Gita, Krishna says very beautifully, you know, I am this, I am this, I am this, I am that. And he says, I am even that the negative tendencies in you. He says it. But I like the explanation you gave, the common cause and the specific cause. How do you reconcile what you say with what is uh, extolled by Krishna in the Bhagavad Gita? In, in Bhagavad Gita, in chapter 14 or something, 18th uh, uh, verse, same Krishna says, there are five things essential for e any action to be performed. Are you aware of that? So he says, in order for any action to be performed in this world, you need to have a body, you need to have your senses, you need to have the perceptive organs, you also need to have God's... Uh, yeah. So unless all these five things cover and pranavaya or pranavaya, those things. So without these five things to be working in cooperation, no action can be taken place. So we don't say Swami doesn't have a role. We have a role, Swami has a role. But if, if it is only Swami is going to do the act, and we say he is the doer, he is the doer, then where, if we make a mistake, he is making a mistake, not me. So if you sing a nice bhajan, if I say, if I come and ask you, hey, your bhajan was great, how did you manage to sing? Oh no, I didn't sing, don't you know? Only Swami sang. Okay. Two days later you go sing, and it doesn't come out well. And you say, it was Swami, don't ask me. <laughs> it is our misunderstanding, basically, that's all. Next one,